Sir. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Steve Cooper. Um, I'm the survey manager for the Staffordshire Alliance. Uh, I'm a Network Rail senior project engineer, open brackets, survey, close brackets, because we like to put surveyors in brackets in, in our business for some reason. <laughs> um, with me, I've got a gentleman called Seth Dale. He is, he's been throughout the Staffordshire Alliance project, my survey engineer, and he's actually now the survey manager for the East West project as well. So um, that's a brief introduction's done. I'd just like to, to before I go into my, my presentation, I'd just like to um, cover a couple of points that a number of our um, presenters have covered this morning when we've talked about survey. Um, we had um, Martin's presentation with his um, information his, his final slide, actually, where he was, he was trying to press the point that survey and the planning of survey works is actually really critical to the whole process that we use uh, within <coughs> most of our major projects, regardless of disciplines. Um, and it's about trying to emphasise that point again to everybody in the room, whether you are a network rail member of staff, whether you are uh, a one of, our design org one of the design organisations, Anybody who's involved with the process of what we do on the railway, we all work and build, we all work from and go to build something based on some form of survey information. Um, and it's just about trying to, again, impress the importance of those early stages of the gathering of survey data to a, a suitable and a, what's perhaps the best word? best way to use it. Um, my former mentor, Mr. Chris Preston, has the best phrase for what we do with survey data. <coughs> uh, I know he's in the room. Um, it should be that we survey once and use it many times. The investment that we make in survey data uh, in an early stage of a project is actually recouped many times throughout the, the later delivery stages. And this is one of the things that has become very evident from the work that we did at Stafford. Um, so that's, that's my little preaching bit over and done with. Um, and we'll just, we just run through uh, a whole heap of information that we've got about Stafford. Okay, um, uh, what I've done with my slides, I know everybody has got the ability to have a copy of these afterwards. And knowing that this is the, the post-lunch presentation, uh, as Steve has already mentioned, if I can keep 30% of the room awake by the time I've finished, mm -hmm. from a survey point of view, I've got some pretty, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so my slides are really quite information heavy, but I'm just going to talk around them. If anybody wants any mo further information, please contact me and Seth later on or in the future, or just have a look at the slides. So that's, that's why there's loads of information. Okay, uh, West Coast Main Line, most of us, uh, obviously everybody's aware in the room, it's uh, one of the busiest mixed freight routes, passenger service in the UK, in Europe, sorry, not just in the UK. Um, and as ever, capacity is a massive constraint. Uh, Staffordshire Alliance, what did we do? What was the purpose of us being, uh, being formed? It was to improve the capacity and the signalling systems within the wider Staffordshire area. So we've got uh, phase one, which was a, a line speed improvement program. Uh, we've got phase two, which was a, the resignalling schemes that, and minor p works that we did at Stafford Station. And then we've got the, the biggie, in effect, the big... <coughs> the big fancy bit at Norton Bridge where we've built uh, a grade separated junction to get the slow line traffic uh, out of the way of the West Coast Main Line. So um, we've built six miles of new 100 mile an hour railway. Uh, as I mentioned, grade separated junction. We've built 11 new structures, uh, four river diversions. We've moved over a million tonnes of earth. Uh, we've diverted um, fuel pipelines, gas pipelines, um, road diversions, we built nearly a kilometre and a half of new road infrastructure, which sometimes is a bit unusual for a railway project, that we're actually being so involved in the actual <laughs> uh, highways environment. And we've uh, been uh, replacing foot crossings with a footbridge, with the obvious um, um, <coughs> implications associated with that. So, one of the things, these are just some of the, some of the photos, photos are always far more interesting for people to to see. Um, one of the things that has been critical to us um, 
Martin touched on it earlier. Uh, it is about the environmental impacts of what we've actually done on the job. Uh, we've had the full, um, the full list of anything that is possibly alive and endangered, in inverted brackets, on the job has happened to live in the former fields that we've developed at Stafford. Um, it's been a partnership between uh, the following <coughs> organisations. We're the first true alliance in the um, rail industry in the UK, following the Australian model. Um, but even though we've had those are the, the th with Network Rail, uh, those are the three main partners. Um, we've still used a, a lot of other different subcontractors sub below that as a, as a tier one suppliers. Um, survey data and BIM, it, um, everybody in the room I would hope is aware of BIM. Obviously in April we go to uh, BIM level two, compliance for all our major projects in the UK. Um, and we found what we did early on within the Staffordshire Alliance was that we decided, or the management team decided to take our approach to BIM to as, um, as far as possible as we could within the, the resources that we had available. So we've actually been using survey data and BIM data to manage clash detection, uh, earthworks, uh, abutments, identification of, uh, and remediation of, of land boundary threats. Uh, at Stafford we have got a, um, a CDO which is a DCO, Dean's in the audience, DCO, Development Consent Order, um, which we were, with the DCO, it was our um, compulsory purchase arrangements and the limitations that we were uh, covered with in the DCO actually had some impacts on how we were actually going to undertake the works. Um, we've used full GPS control of all our earthworks and plant and also for all our general setting out. Um, it's all been used uh, by our site team to understand uh, the design and illustrate our construction methodology that we've used across the project. And then we've rolled in some 4D works as well. Here's a typical example of, of one of the bits of our BIM data. Um, so here we can see we've got our river diversion design, uh, we've got our existing river, embankments, piling, OLE, signaling, everything integrated, all in one environment. Oops. And then here what we can see is we've taken that information and we've applied some 3D scanning data to it to check this is actual 3D as-built data from the scan uh, to make sure that we are actually building things in the same place and the correct place that we should have been doing. Um, integrating that with the BIM model uh, directly, which was found has been a, a very useful uh, and cost-effective way of checking data. Okay, uh, how are we doing for time? Eight minutes. Right, uh, remote track monitoring systems. Whilst we've been doing all this work at Stafford, uh, we've been working adjacent to both the West Coast Main Line, which has always been open, and the Norton Bridge to Stone Branch Line. Where we've been undertaking works that would potentially affect the zone of influence for track and any adjoining structures, we've been um, operating a full 3D um, total station-based monitoring system. One of the problems that we've had at Stafford is being with our geographical location, we've got very poor, oops, we've got, I missed, hold on. Uh, we've got very poor mobile phone signal. Um, ordinarily with remote track monitoring systems, what we would use is a phone SIM card to actually transmit that data back uh, wherever it needs to go. We've not had that opportunity at Stafford because of the, uh, the surrounding uh, cell net systems that we've got. So we've actually, be, uh, we've actually had to be quite creative in using 5G directional Wi-Fi dishes communicating to some sub-cell towers which are like 10 kilometres away. Um, that data would then be transmitted back through the internet to a secure IP address and we would actually Im interrogate that data on a desktop computer in the office. Uh, so the kit that we've actually used to undertake this work um, as I already said, we are, Stafford is predominantly in the, has been in the middle of a, uh, a farming environment, with lots of fields, 
very little power and very little access. So to overcome a lot of those issues, what we've actually done is we went to use an, a, uh, a solar powered system for all our track monitoring and communications equipment. Uh, all the radio comms has gone out from the total station, monitoring targets on the track, uh, powered by the solar panel and the uninterruptible power supply, battery backup, through the 5G Wi-Fi, back out to the office. And that's provided us with a, an email and text alert for any issues that may have arisen. Fortunately, we haven't run into any issues, touch wood, uh, so far. Everything has progressed as planned, but we've still got to demonstrate that we've got a suitable monitoring system to ensure that we limit or we minimise any risk to the operational railway. Um, <coughs> On a, a slightly different note, not just from a, a technical point of view, and, and I understand most of us are, are, are engineers in the room, from a safety point of view, travelling to site is often one of the most risky parts of the job that we do when we work on the railway. We're going to our remote um, track monitoring systems, in six months we've actually removed the requirement for 549 surveyor crew operation site shifts per instrument location across our job. We've got seven total station instruments that we use across the program, and that's actually removed the requirement for nearly 4,500 man shifts on a job, which is really quite, from a non-technical point of view, from the basic safety premise, is really quite a massive win, not just for the project, but for anybody who's been involved in it. Because we have a, a our, because of the conditions associated with our planning consents, We've actually removed over 8,700 vehicle journeys through the local environment. Anybody who might be familiar with our site will be aware that we are in the middle of the countryside. We've got lots of little one-track roads, and we are very conscious of how we're going to affect and impact our local neighbours. By removing nearly 9,000 car journeys over a six-month period is really quite a massive win for the project. Um, one thing to really to take note out of this, on our project, for some people who've worked on some of the bigger jobs, Paddington, uh, Thames Leak, remote monitoring is not a unique thing to do, but we've been able to modify it with the solar panel UPSs and being the first people to actually run such a system from the solar panels. Uh, that price, in the half a million pounds, is what we spent on the equipment. Um, surveying's not a cheap industry, it's not a cheap process, but the actual system, because of all the, si because of all the other the associated works we've removed from it, um, has allowed to, to demonstrate a benefit of over 3 million quid. And we also get 50% buyback when we finish with the kit from the suppliers. So there's quite, there are quite significant sums of money associated with actually not having to send someone to site. Um, let's move to the next one. Uh, GPS, uh, this slide, basic premise. GPS with satellites, American military satellites whizzing around out in space. And they are used for in your som in your tom toms, in your sat navs, in your mobile phone to produce a coordinated position where you live or where you happen to be. One of the problems that we have, because uh, as I said earlier, we've used 3D machine control to construct all our heavy civils works. Um, in order for us to maintain, let's say, a 15 to 20 millimeter accuracy with all that equipment, we have to have a secondary differential signal in order to, to go from the 10 meters that you would have, say, with your TomTom -tom down to less than an inch with our, our, our equipment. Ordinarily in the surveying industry, we would use one of the industry suppliers, Trimble or Lycas correction services, which we dial to via a SIM card in our logger. Again, Stafford, we've got no cell set, we've got no real cell coverage. So what we had to do is we had to, we had to uh, set up our own base station to provide that service to ourselves. One of the issues that we have with surveying equipment, as the, the few people in the room will know, is that we all work on the 2.4 gigahertz um, open source channel. That's exactly the same channel as the Wi-Fi on the Virgin Trains, as the cross, 
the Wi-Fi on the cross-country trains, as the Wi-Fi in the office, as the Wi-Fi in any house that we happen to be nearby. Um, so we were struggling really with getting our signal transmitted over that particular frequency. Uh, and we were actually the first network rail project really to actually go to Ofcom and have our own personal radio frequency allocated to us. Uh, nobody else had done that before, uh, in definitely in, in our part of the world. Uh, and it, allow, it also allows us to transmit a really strong signal. So all our GPS-based equipment, all the dozers, all the diggers, all the engineers who happen to have a GPS rover, have all had um, <coughs> really good, strong uh, fixes from our base station. Why is this important? You, you probably, a lot of you are thinking, if the guys lose that fix and that ability to receive the differential signal, accuracy <coughs> goes back to 10 meters. So if we, have a, if we have a situation where the guys can't get the signal, we've got machines stood down, we've got manpower stood down. Um, hence the reason this is one of the cost benefits that we managed to provide, because we kept the machinery and the manpower working continuously. Um, I think that is pretty much what I just summarized. Um, and I did that one too, well done. Uh, 3D machine control, quite simply, dozer with either a GPS mast on the top or a, a survey target mounted on the top that we orientate. The machine knows where that particular point in space is and the direction it's traveling in. So therefore we can control the pitch, attitude and cross level of the dozer's blade. This again ties back into the BIM data. All our, da all our design data is in 3D in BIM. Across the project, we haven't used any batterboards. We haven't had people going setting out and spraying up for uh, LB4 lasers. Um, we've been able to minimize the human interface with machinery by not having that human interface there. Running to three full 3D machine control means we don't have to put somebody in a position of risk. Uh, UAV photogrammetry. Um, from a surveyor's point of view, those of us in the room, this bit's the, the sort of the fun bit. Um, how are we doing for people still being awake? Most of you, yeah, we're doing well. <laughs> we've got about third, we've got, yeah, we've got at least half the room still awake. Um, UAVs. We were the first people to use um, the new network rail approved suppliers for unmanned aerial vehicles to undertake photogrammetry from low level. A number of you in the room are familiar with the LiDAR and the other photogrammetry data that we have. Uh, some, of it have used, some of you have used it on your projects. A lot of it is in what we now have as the root infrastructure network model. Uh, three Network Rails Flight Ops team. We've got four approved suppliers that we can use to undertake some low-level photogrammetry. One of the advantages of UAV photogrammetry is the actual production rates that we can achieve with it. Uh, a 10 minute a 10 minute flight can cover an area a kilometer by 50 meters wide if we were to compare that with the productivity of a man with a gps rover going out checking as built uh, we can't achieve anywhere near that sort of capacity uh, it would take as i've already said it would take over a shift to to get a comparable um do you want to press play for everybody in the room this is actually what they look like Sorry, there's no, there isn't any exciting sound clips or anything. So what we actually have is, you can see there's a camera mounted pointing downwards below the craft, and then he's just dropped his little landing legs. It's interesting to note, or important to note, that the approved suppliers that we have this gentleman here is the pilot of the craft, and part of his, uh, part of the um, approvals process that we have within Network Rail, he's actually a qualified pilot as well. So we're not just using people who have taught themselves how to fly UAVs. And to finish with, well, not to finish, but Seth, do you want to hit this one? Uh, this is a 3D PDF that's been produced from the photogrammetry that was produced from the, the UAV. So you can see quite easily we can cover a quite a large area of a, of a work site. Ours is uh, 
we've got an advantage because we've obviously got a, a large greenfield type environment. Um, but we can produce reasonable quality 3D data in both laterally and, laterally and vertically from having the UAV fly over the top. One of the things that we've actually also used it for is for video data capture. So we have the, the UAV go around flying with a little video camera, a GoPro underneath, and then we use that in the office for lots of people who whoever may wish to look at the data to get a, a bird's eye view of where we are at with the project at that time. So I'm just going to pass over to Seth to do a little bit now. Right, and let's just talk about uh, some of the 3D scanning that we've been doing on the project with the use of point clouds um, and a software called 3D Reshaper. Um, so uh, the photo's not come up. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <coughs> this particular um, task was to the the signal gantry you see there in the middle um, needed to be removed. Um, it's in the middle of a farmer's field, so that we had a few access problems. Uh, so we ended up doing a, a scan of it to see whether we could do it from trackside or alternatively we would have to uh, build a, a, an access road and uh, dig up the farmer's field. So from that I did the scanning with the uh, MS50 and in 3D Reshaper I've extracted the, uh, the cables quite quickly. And from that, I export into CAD and, and hand it over to the engineer to, to see whether he could fit that signal gantry down in between the cables. So that'll lift it up and do it all from track site instead of off the farmer's fields. So, like I said, we're using the uh, MS50, which is a total station type scanner. And also uh, on the project, we've been using the P20, which is a standard static scanner for the engineering checks, as built surveys, volume surveys, monitoring, rail corridor structures, just like the one we've seen, and pre-designed surveys. This is bridge two, uh, bridge one. So I've done a, uh, a P20 scan of it, and then within 3D Reshaper, I've been able to compare directly to the BIM model, so importing the BIM model into 3D Reshaper directly and comparing a 3D object to a point cloud giving you a, a heat map to see how far out of design the structure is in reality. That's bridge two, the same thing. You can see one, one wing walls out <coughs> slightly on the bottom left there. <coughs> this is one of the retaining walls we had a few problems with, um, it was built with a bit of a, a bulge, um, so I was asked to, asked to monitor it um, to see if it's, it's going to keep bulging or is it going to stay where it is. Um, it, uh, it did stay, it was a little bit of movement but not, not much, but uh, it was very impressive. Uh, no, too far. The, the, the quality of, of the scan data and, and comparing <coughs> it um, was quite, we were actually able to pick up um, millimetre movements on, on the, uh, <coughs> the RICO wall. So again with the heat maps, um, this, this example is with the earthworks, so going through the cutting, we've 3D scan the entire cutting as we're going as a progress reports and um, giving you back quality control. So you've got your um, heat map showing what's what's <coughs> the reds high, blues low. See how well they're doing with the earthworks, and also uh, cutting cross sections through it, showing it in section. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing on the job is we've been using. Uh, the Trimble Vorsis track measuring system. Um, it isn't something that's brand new. Uh, it's something that's been available to the industry, and I know it's been used in Steve's uh, track team on the renewals program for a little bit of time now. Uh, but here, we've been using it uh, to directly facilitate the rapid production of tamping data once we'd actually put the track in. So here we can see we've got, oh, wrong way. Uh, we've got 
total station sat on a trolley and we've got another target trolley sat behind. What happens is we, we orientate the trolley with the instrument on at a known survey point and then we take observations to our target trolley and then push the target trolley towards the total station. One of the advantages of this system over for a job such as ours, because as I said earlier, we've installed six miles worth of twin track, 12 miles worth of single track effectively. That's a lot of track to survey and to get the, the data ready to go into the tamper. And using the software that comes with it, the um, Guido Office, we're actually able to produce the front offset files for the tamper uh, within about five to 10 minutes. And so we've got a rapid turnaround between survey data acquisition and then getting that information out onto, onto a machine. And likewise, for as built in for the quality control behind the machine to make sure that we've got the lifts and slews that we need. Uh, final bit of a, an overview, just to give people a, a slight sense of scale. Uh, this is not, this is for helicopter shot, this one. So what we have here, looking south, we've got the southern tie-in, uh, we've got the um, down slow up Norton Bridge alignment as we come up here to tie into the west coast. Sorry, this is the west coast main line. And then we've got the Norton Bridge junction and the branch line coming off. So you can actually see in some of these, this is the road and rail over bridge and through the adjoining works as we, f as we finish the thing. <coughs> uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, please come and, and grab us towards the end. Thank you. We've got time for one or two quick questions now in the room if anybody has got any questions. While you are, while you are thinking of them, I'll, I'll just come to you in a second. Uh, while, while you're thinking of them, uh, just a, uh, a thank you from me to the Staffordshire Alliance because we, uh, we, we've got the, the Northern SNC Alliance and the Southern SNC Alliance um, and we likewise have used the, uh, uh, the Australian Pure Alliance model. Uh, and we were the second people in network real to do it because Stafford were third, and we went up and shamelessly copied a lot of the learning and it's uh, it's been really as a I've been doing this sort of stuff for 30 years now it's probably the best <coughs> contract vehicle I have I have operated in it's uh, it's a very impressive uh, uh, alliance model sorry sir question uh, yeah the um, I'll probably want the mic the um, what's your verification for the for that UAV particularly for the as built obviously Okay, so when, when we went with the UAV verification using photogrammetry, um, we checked that against a sample area that we'd surveyed conventionally, and then we checked it against another, uh, the same area that we'd surveyed with the laser scanner, with the MS-50, the total station-based um, scanner. So from the total station-based scanner, we have plus or minus two mil. It is the scanner's accuracy. When we look at the photogrammetry from the UAVs, what I would say is the technology is not there yet. Vertically, we were probably, it ranged between 60 to 70 millimeters out in vertical. Horizontally, the control was okay, but vertically, there was a slight issue with it. Um, when we're doing photogrammetry, what we have to do is we have to have ground marker plates mounted along the route that we're going to fly. They've got to be pre-coordinated. Um, it's been suggested that perhaps if we'd increased the pixel density of the camera that we'd use, we might have got a better result, or if we did increase the density of the ground marker plates. I would say our ground marker plates were installed at 50 meter intervals or anywhere where we had a, an elevation change of more than a meter. So uh, in my mind at this stage, UAV photogrammetry is not, suit, is not necessarily a suitable tool yet for, to replace topo. It can be a little bit better than LiDAR, but then again, it depends on how you specified your LiDAR data. Is the system in use a single pass or a multi-pass? Uh, we were doing system. right it's with the photogrammetry system. The way that it was oriented, the way that the photographs were taken, uh, were that there was a seventy percent overlap on each photograph mm -hmm. from each surrounding photograph. Um, does that answer your question? Because we would only fly it once, but we would have that amount of overlap on the actual photographs so themselves. So it's a single flight. Yes. Right, so it's one angle, essentially. So yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Are you looking at multi-pass? Uh, no, not at this stage, because what we've actually progressed to is to use the P20 and also now the P40, which is a laser scanner with a 200 meter range. So we orientate the scanner with our precise GPS, and then we can shoot a 200 meter uh, circle around that particular scanner. For us, it's more efficient than sending, and safer, than sending a man up and down. You saw some of the, uh, 
the depth of the cutting that we have there, we've got some very steep batters on the job. And it wouldn't be practical or safe to actually have somebody with a GPS rover going up and down them to make sure we've got the correct profile. So we've actually progressed to using the scanner to, uh, to do that information gathering. Okay. Yep. Cheers, guys. Thank, thank you. you very much. And well done. Thank you. Thank you.